welcome to all of you who are gathered here. My name is Mary Ellen Quinn. I'm the co-coordinator of Pops Christi, Maine. On behalf of all of our co-sponsoring groups, we thank you for coming today. We thank you for standing together to call on our government to close the prison at Guantanamo Bay. Last Wednesday, January 11, marked the 21st anniversary of its opening. This prison has existed for far too long. We stand together today calling for an end to the torture, detention, and imprisonment of people at Guantanamo and at other places in our world where human rights are denied. We stand today in solidarity with those who've been released and those still remaining we see the suffering. We see the inhumane treatment. We know the grave costs of war and we grieve. We grieve for the victim. We grieve for the perpetrator, for their families and friends, for communities and for the environment. War in all of its forms is a cycle of violence that destroys, that creates more violence, a cycle that is supported, perpetuated, and embedded in our culture. We know there's another way, the way of nonviolence, the way of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr of Mahatma Gandhi, of Jesus of Nazareth, of Dorothy Day, and so many others. Each of our speakers here today have dedicated themselves to building peace, promoting justice, to following the way of nonviolence and civil resistance. We look forward to hearing from Frank Panopoulos, a human rights attorney who represents one of the men detained at Guantanamo. Maureen Kehoe Austinson of Smiling Trees Disarmament Farm. Dud Hendrick, Maine Veterans for Peace. And Don will be speaking for John Rabbi. Peace Action Maine, and Mary Kate Small, Pox Christi Maine, and Witness Against Torture. Following these speakers, there will be time for others who wish to say a few words. We welcome anyone here to speak about the closing of Guantanamo. There will be song and a closing prayer to bring our gathering to an end. Thank you again for being here. We ask Frank Panopoulos to come up to the mic. Thanks, Mary Ellen. Hello, everybody. Um, first, I'd like to say um, a thank you for being here. Um, I can't tell you how much this means to the prisoners who are at Guantanamo. You know, I represent one of the prisoners there, and when I go down and meet with him, and I tell them about you know these vigils and these demonstrations and how people not you know around the U.S. Um, stand and hold banners to close Guantanamo and stand in solidarity with them, they're really moved. They they really not only appreciate it, but it, it gives them a sort of hope because you can imagine, you know. A lot of these guys have been there since 2002, right? As the leaflet says, there's 35 prisoners still at Guantanamo out of 780 that went through there. Of those 35, 23 are held without charge indefinitely. And of those 23, 
20 have already been cleared to be released, you know, many more than a year ago. So when I tell, you know, my, my, you know, my client, he tells the others and they really, really appreciate it. So a thank you from them. Um, and then, you know, look, we're here. We're here because this is the right thing to do, right? We, Guantanamo was a place that was built in secret. The, the prisoners who were held there, their names weren't even released until 2006. You know, when it was, it was started to be populated in 2002. It was built not only in secret, but it was based on secret memoranda that the government issues, um, redefining what torture means, talking, um, you know, rede redefining our obligations under international agreements like the Geneva Conventions, secret memoranda that were used <clears throat> to uh, torture people at Guantanamo that weren't disclosed until 2009. And, and you know, a secret memoranda, secret prisons, you know, a, a secret war on terror that operates in the shadows, you know, like, like Cheney said, that operates on the dark side, you know, that's not that's not what we should be, right? So we come here to uncover it, and uh, um, you know, the, it costs 13 and a half. Well, it costs 14 million dollars per prisoner at Guantanamo from our country's budget. It's about 500 million dollars a year, and so that's money that could better be spent in our communities, right? We we have communities that are that are crumbling, dilapidated, people can't afford health care, you know, people are in debt. And instead of building communities and, and, and helping communities lift people and make it a better place, we spend it on Guantanamo, we spend it on weapons. The nuclear weapons budget for the U.S. now is $1 trillion in the next 10 years to build a new generation of nuclear weapons that don't keep us secure at all, right? It's, it's, it's a myth, just like Guantanamo is the myth, that Guantanamo made us safe from terrorism, but really, <laughs> the really it didn't make us safe from terrorism, and in fact, it just increased our enemies. Um, and, you know, lastly, you know, we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King, his, his, uh, <clears throat> his holiday on Monday, and Dr. King said it plainly, you know, a country that spends increasingly more money on the military, is approaching or has approached or is in spiritual death, spiritual annihilation. And what we're doing here today is trying to revive the spirit. So I, I thank you very much and most importantly, um, Abdul Malik, my client and all the others at Guantanamo, the prisoners, thank you very much. So, thank you. Oh, okay, um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Frank, I don't know if you noticed, but as you were speaking, uh, a bald eagle flew over your head. Um, so that's, uh, in the United States, that's the symbol of, of freedom. And um, I think that's really why we're here. We're looking for freedom and looking for uh, ways to uh, help the people in Guantanamo be free, but also ways to free our country from our deep, dark, and ugly secrets. And the only way that we can be free is by doing what we're doing now to be shoulder to shoulder with each other, trying to deal with the reality of what our nation is doing in Guantanamo in our name. Um, so I think that eagle is a symbol to us that uh, we want freedom and that we need freedom. And freedom is about dealing with reality and looking reality uh, hard at, at it in a hard and difficult way and bringing that reality to a place of love. Um, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of this uh, vigil. I was really moved by it last year as well. And um, I thank you all for being out. I thank you all for being out in the uh, bitter weather. So um, thank you very much. I'm Doug Hendrick representing Veterans for Peace. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Wabanaki people, the people who were the first stewards of this land from whom we still have a great deal to learn. For over 20 years now, every Monday afternoon, I've stood on Route 15 on Deer Isle with like-minded citizens representing Island Peace and Justice. We stand in objection and in witness to the acts of our government in our names. 
each week I reflect on just why I am there, and each week I arrive unavoidably at the conclusion that the U.S. is the scourge of the planet and a rogue nation. To enumerate a very few of the litany of the crimes that come to mind but are so egregious as to haunt me. The Vietnam War. As a Vietnam veteran of the nightmare visited on that country, that war is never far from my conscience and frankly always soon to return. My reflections also take me to Agent Orange, arguably the most hideous aspect of that misbegotten war. There remain institutionalized two to three million victims of Agent Orange unable to take care of themselves. I think then of the secret bombing of Laos and its legacy, thousands upon thousands of unexploded ordnance lie buried across their country, waiting to take the legs and the lives of the innocent people wanting only to work or to play or simply walk on their land. I think of all the people around the world who live close by our nearly 800 bases on foreign lands. We have over three times the total number of bases on foreign lands owned by other countries. And I think about the environment under the assault of those bases all around the world. And I think particularly of the people of the Marshall Islands and of Thule Greenland and of Diego Garcia, all places from which natives were forcibly removed to make way for the U.S. military. I have visited members of those communities. I have heard the hideous tales, the nightmares that they revealed they're all peculiar to a capacity that this country has for othering, a term brought to my attention by the famous Brian Wilson, who many of you will know of as having lost both his legs, objecting to and standing in the way of an armaments train, taking shipments of munitions down to Nicaragua. His often voiced mantra, we are worth more, they are worth less. It seems all the more to be the slogan of this country. Then, of course, there's the atomic bomb, the only country to ever use atomic weapons. During the Vietnam War, I understand that the U.S. threatened to use atomic weapons at least 13 times. Sounds like rogue behavior to me. Now we have learned that there will be a christening of another warship, the USS Fallujah, enshrining the battles in that town in Iraq of that name. Our legacy there includes a veritable explosion of babies born with congenital abnormalities attributable to our use of illegal chemical weapons. International treaties offer further evidence of rogue nation behavior. There we stand above, or should we say below, all others. Of the world's 198 states, 196 are party to the Convention on Biological Diversity. Two are not one of them being the United States. Among other treaties the U.S. has refused to ratify are the Rome Statute on International Crimes, the treaties banning cluster bombs and landmines, the Convention on Discrimination Against Women, the Convention on Hazardous Waste, and the Test Ban Treaty. The only nation on Earth not to ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the U.S., as well as the only nation to sentence children to life imprisonment without parole. There remain today about 2,500 people serving life for crimes they were involved in years ago when they were children. And of course, we well know of the horrific fates of many who have worked to put the lie to this notion of America's self-purported exceptionalism. Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Reality Winner, Chelsea Manning, Daniel Hale, they come to mind. The author, George Monbiot, characterizes all of this as manifestation of America's claim to exceptionalism. He characterizes it as an active, proud, and furious refusal to care about the lives of others. All of it, all of it smacks of rogue behavior. Our country doesn't give a damn about the rest of the world. We do what we please. 
We are fed the fiction that we are the exceptional nation. This is not simply a rant. This is straight line stuff, all related, all relevant. I believe our extraordinary capacity for othering, our exceptionalism is rooted in our European ancestors believing it was their destiny to rule over indigenous lands. I believe that we can draw this straight line from the genocide of the indigenous peoples of this continent, maybe as many as 16 million people, through the slave trade, a straight line to our contemporary ability to other people. I believe that Guantanamo stands as symbolic of all of this. Guantanamo Base stands on foreign land to which we have no right and are not wanted. I have visited Guantanamo City and I have stood with the people of that area who object strenuously to our presence there. Islamophobia clearly explains the reality of Guantanamo Prison. The poor souls there are other as other can be. They are as other as other can be. Every man and boy in prison there has been a Muslim or is, or as so frequently characterized, the worst of the worst. Americans are led to believe that being Muslim, they are inherently terroristic and irredeemable. When we think of the forsaken souls at Guantanamo, we know silence is not an option. Guantanamo persists as a symbol. There's a level of complicity we all share. Biden says he wants to close it. It's incumbent upon every American to hold him to the stated intention. Thank you very much. There's a song from Ray Charles which starts like this. My mother told me before she passed away, son, when I'm gone, don't forget to pray because there'll be hard times. Hard times. We're here today because Guantanamo is an explicit case of the dangers of militarism, intolerance, and racism, which Martin Luther King Jr. warned us about two generations ago. Dangers which have grown more perilous over the past several years. We're here today because we're tired of our country steeping itself in evil and ignoring what it has wrought. We're tired of its tendency to cultivate strange fruit. We have heard it said that in America, no one is above the law. What happens when the law goes slack? What sort of rules-based order replaces it? And how are the rules enforced? Are there exceptions? After all, we have heard it said that America is an ex exceptional nation. The inmates of Guantanamo are exceptional people. They aren't soldiers in a foreign army, so they aren't prisoners of war, which means their jailers don't have to worry about the Geneva Conventions. They aren't ordinary defendants either, so their jailers don't need to bother with due process. There's no need to charge them with anything or to release them when they're cleared for release. What becomes of these exceptional people? There are hard slaps in the face. There are body slams against the walls. There are the blindfolds and the hoods and the shackles. There is denial of clothing and sleep. There is waterboarding, which is akin to drowning. Imagine, if you will, a combination of force feeding and administered without anesthetic. It is politeness. The CIA calls these things enhanced interrogation. The civilized world has another word term for it. If such things happened every once in a while, there would these would be incidents drawn out over 20 years. They become habit. And as we know, habit shapes character. This is how our country creates more enemies and more exceptions. This is how it will destroy itself unless we break it first. Again, that was written by John Raby. We hear a beautiful sound. It is the breaking of chains. We see a path full of hope. We have found a way, let them go home, let them go home, let them go home, let them go home today. So good of everyone to come out for this. It's a, a horrible thing, Guantanamo, but it's such a good thing to be together.
And little by little, as we can educate ourselves and educate others, uh, maybe we can get this, uh, the cry to grow louder and louder in our country to let, for example, the 20 cleared for release, one 12 years ago cleared for release, uh, free. I'm with a group called Parks Christi, Maine, which I adore. And I'm also with a group called Witness Against Torture. We just finished, uh, there was a gathering in Washington, uh, a fast for justice, fasting, and uh, uh, working together on the streets of DC to raise awareness. But it's really here in Maine, it's in every state around our uh, coffee tables and uh, work coolers and wherever that we just need to talk about the lies that we've been told and speak the truth about the shame that is Guantanamo. Just now, trying to give out a flyer, a young man said to me, they're terrorists, they deserve to be there. Well, that's not the truth. And so I hope that we can continue to do what we're doing and bring others to join us and uh, encourage President Biden to get them out of there as soon as possible. Thanks everybody.